Welcome to AMP2 Lab. Today, we're doing the endocrine lab. And in the endocrine lab, we're going to start with this hormone handout. And I always want to give background as to how, how things are laid out. You know, when you get a sheet, don't just jump into the middle of the sheet. Look at how it's laid out. And this is how it's laid out. And most of you already know from lecture how it's laid out. We may have mentioned this before. Over here's the gland, and under the gland, there's the hormone. In the center is where the target cells are located. So do you see that? Sometimes they're generalized all over the body, and sometimes it's real particular. And then on the side are the effects. And as we go through this for lab, you won't actually need every single detail on here for lab the way that I teach the lab right now. So what I'm going to do for you is the functions that you need for lab, I'll put a little asterisk in front of. If it doesn't have an asterisk here, it's because I didn't get to it yet, all right? Or, if you notice, like under growth hormone, it says growth and then these others. Those others would be for lecture only, all right? And that's how I'm going to keep it separate. It's so you know what you need for lab and lecture. Because we do a little more of an overview in lab than we do in lecture. In lecture, we get all the details in there. So this is how we're going to start today. We're going to start with the anterior pituitary. I'm going to do a little background information on the anterior pituitary. And then we're going to jump right into slides. Now, this is recorded on campus for the campus class. So I'll be talking about some stuff that's just relevant to the campus even though there may be times that people listen to this in a web course. For the pituitary gland, first thing that we want to do is look at the picture that's in the book. And on the picture in the book, notice what you see. You see something that looks like this little drawing right here, don't you? Right? Theirs is better. But hey, you know, they don't pay me for my drawing. But here's what this drawing does. And I want you guys to be able to draw some stuff because it helps you. No matter which picture you're looking at at the pituitary, notice there's two parts. There's a bigger portion, which is this, and then there's a smaller portion, which is here. The larger portion is towards the front. So what do you think we might call that? Nice, anterior pituitary. By the way, look what we can do. Computers are just amazingly wonderful. The pituitary has an anterior pituitary. Do you see that on your handout? That means there's also a, look you right there, posterior pituitary right there. So let me show you on the picture. Here's the posterior pituitary. The reason that I have drawn this in such a, manner is to show you that these are actually, this is, even though it's one gland, it really functions like two separate glands, and they are two completely different types of tissue. What would you say, from what you know already, most glands are what kind of tissue? Epithelium, Epithelium but more specifically, cuboidal. Cuboidal epithelium. The majority of glands are cuboidal epithelium. The anterior pituitary is a normal gland. So what kind of tissue is it made from? Cuboidal epithelium, exactly. The anterior pituitary is cuboidal epithelium because it is a normal gland, a normal endocrine gland, I should say. Look right here. Look at how I've drawn this. And I'll put some more little cubes right here with their little nuclei clustered together right there. There's your anterior pituitary. Posterior pituitary, however, is an extension of neurons that come down from the hypothalamus, nervous tissue, nervous tissue. And you see it right there. Look, that's a neuron. Don't be nervous. It's not scary. It's just a little neuron right there. Hey, Andy, what are these? Look, up there. What are these? Dendrites. Dendrites. And what's this big long one that comes out right here, guys? That is an axon. An axon. Remember axon? And what are these little tips called? Those are called axon terminals. Some might prefer synaptic knobs. Others might prefer boutons. 
However, we we'll usually say terminals, axon terminals, or synaptic knob terminals, something like that. Hey, what do most neurons release? Neurotransmitters, but a neurotransmitter would be released across the synapse. There are actually capillaries here as well as here so that these chemicals can be released into the blood. That means that these chemicals that are released will be called what? Hormones. Released into the blood, travel through the body, have their effect on some target tissue. Hormones. Some of them are the exact same chemical. Some of them are bigger and some of them are smaller. It depends what the physical makeup of that chemical is. Yeah, yeah, isn't that crazy? Because of how they work. They go in the blood, they travel a great distance, they bind to a receptor and they stimulate the cell, so we call them hormones. Yes, from, yes, from whether we're talking out here, there'll be capillaries all over the place here, and there'll be some capillaries over here too, and it will release it into that, and then it will travel to the blood. Okay? And what's up here? Oh, right up here. Right, that's the hypothalamus. Keep that in mind. The hypothalamus up there. Hypothalamus is part of what organ of the brain, Alicia? No, oh, it would be the brain. Sorry, I meant to say. What region of the brain? Anybody remember from AMP1? It's a tough one, that's why I asked you. So close. It is deep within. So, now the cerebrum's up top, cerebellum's in the back, diencephalon. That's a part of the diencephalon. You remember that? The thalamus and the hypothalamus. That little mid kind of ancient part of the brain. Diencephalon. Anyway, I won't ask you that in this class. I'm just just making you go, oh, I should know that. I should know that. Okay. When I study this stuff, or when I teach it, and when I studied it, these are kind of the key points that I would know. Hey, what kind of tissue is this made of? Right? The front's cuboidal epithelium and the back is nervous tissue. So let me just ask you, do you think if you saw a slide picture of this that the two regions should look different? Because they're different tissue, right? So this is magic. All we have to do, since the picture didn't stay open, is go find it somewhere. I already saved it down there. Pituitary. It's gone. I only have 100. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, but I like 40 better. Oh, am I blind? Told you I was having contact problems. That's thyroid 40. Oh, my goodness. It was in the wave. I lost it in the wave. Excuse me for my oldness there. If you look right here, you can see that this is one distinct kind of tissue, even though it's a little dark right here. And this is a different kind of tissue. What do you think? I think that that's pretty easy to see, and I like this even better. What do you think? One kind of tissue, a completely different kind of tissue. Right. Why is this anterior pituitary? Because they're cuboidal cells. And you're right. They do look more packed together, don't they? And sometimes I'll turn the light off. I don't want to leave it off the whole time, but um, it helps on some of these pictures. See, you see it a lot better, right? When the lights go off, now you can get sleepy because of melatonin, but we'll talk about that later. All right. So that's cuboidal epithelium, and this right here is nervous tissue. Now, this is the first slide, so you have nothing to compare it to except your memory from AMP1, correct? But I will tell you, there is no other tissue that will do today, no other gland that will do today that will look like this. Characteristically, it has two regions that are separated by, well, they just butt up against each other right there. Do you see that? And that makes it distinct for what we're going to be doing. Now, this is a normal gland, so we may see other glands that look kind of like this part up here because it's cuboidal epithelium. 
but they will have different characteristics mixed in as well. And when you learn those characteristics and understand that, and that this is the only one where you see endocrine and nervous tissue looking like this side by side, or cuboidal epithelium and nervous tissue, it makes your life a lot easier. Because our test will be looking at slides and answering questions based on the slide. So here's a sample. What kind of tissue is this? Nervous tissue. Name this region of the gland. Posterior pituitary. I usually say posterior. Pardon? No, I know. Oh, no, I heard. Yeah, you did. I heard posterior and posterior. It doesn't. No, you can say posterior. That's okay. It's correct. It's just different regions say it differently. And this is which region of the gland? Anterior pituitary. But what fun would life be if I only gave you one name for each of those regions? Right? This is AMP2. We gotta have at least two names for everything we do all semester. Just kidding. yeah, here we go. We're going to the handout. The anterior pituitary is known as the adenohypophysis, and the posterior is the neurohypophysis. Notice they both have hypophysis, so that must mean pituitary. Well, what in the world could neuro mean? It tells you what kind of tissue. Right? Nervous tissue. Exactly. That's not really that tough to remember, is it? The hypothesis, the spelling's not easy, but we already know the posterior pituitary is nervous tissue, so it's nice that they give us a name like neurohypothesis. Well, what do you think adeno means? Oh, some of y'all are sharp. Some of y'all listen to Tegrity, and you're like, he sounds like a recording of himself. Okay. The adenohypothesis means glandular pituitary. Adeno means gland, just like adenoids are glands. I may ask you on a test to give me the longest name, one word name that you know for this region. That would be a way for me to get you to put adeno hypothesis instead of anterior pituitary. You should know both of those terms for each of these regions. And then if we're doing this gland, it's very important that you know before you walk in here on test day all the hormones either produced or secreted from each region. Okay? Because if you don't own them, if you don't know them, and if you can't reproduce them on your own, well, when you come in here, you're sure is not going to be as relaxed and it's not going to be as easy as it would be you just saying it to yourself, Right? Therefore, you've got to own it. And here's how I know if I own it. Can I draw it? Here's, look how I do it. This is how I do the glands to see if I know the different hormones. Now, you can look, if you choose to right now, on the sheet, and it lists the hormones for you. But you can also look here and see what I did. When you own this, you can draw your little anterior pituitary and posterior here, and you can go... The hormones from the anterior pituitary are growth hormones, thyroid-stimulating hormones, adrenocorticotropic hormones, prolactin, and two of them, you'll notice on your sheet, do you see that word gonadotropins on your sheet? Yes. Gonadotropins is a category, and these two fit into that category. They are follicle-stimulating hormones, and luteinizing hormone. They're the two gonadotropins. Those are the six hormones that are produced by the anterior pituitary. Notice, they are produced here, and they also are released, or if we're doing a gland, we could say secreted, couldn't we? And if you notice, I wrote that up here. Okay, you guys see that? Yes. Gonadotropins? No, I don't. And I didn't, on this sheet, actually I didn't make the sheet, but that's not to the point. We don't have another column where we can put region or category. Oh, okay. Yeah, growth is one. So there's six of them, and then this is the category. All right. Now, how do these hormones travel? And where do they go? And what are they looking for? 
And what are those receptors on? Oh my goodness. Cool. So that they can have their own function, right? And what do you think the function of growth hormone is? Well, I'll be. It's to grow. What a shock. As you look at the handout, you can see that for lab, that's all I, that's the depth I need you to know. Growth hormone travels through the body, its targets generalized, and it causes growth. In lecture, sure, we'll talk about these things being necessary for growth, or how they're necessary, or why, and we'll even add more to it, to be honest. All right, the next hormone is called thyroid stimulating hormone. Do you want to take a while guess what it stimulates? The thyroid. That means the thyroid is the target. Does thyroid stimulating hormone just go to the thyroid? Andy, it goes where? It goes everywhere. Why does it go everywhere, Marissa? Because it travels through the blood. Exactly. And they all go everywhere, don't they? We can't forget that. They all go everywhere. But the receptors are only where? On the target cell, which in this case is? The thyroid. Exactly. ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, targets the adrenal cortex. Notice I'm going really fast. And those are the two things that it causes. I'm going to let you read that on your own. We'll probably talk about it in lecture a little bit. Okay? Then we have this little cool one called prolactin. Anybody happen to be making milk right now? and want to share that with the class? Not at the moment. Okay, and this is a Tuesday class, so I know we already talked about this in class, didn't we, Andy? Yeah, we did. And n neither Andy nor myself are making milk, have ever made milk, or plan to make milk, but could we? Yeah. Why? Because we have mammary glands and we have prolactin, and if, you know, a little magic happened in the body, then it, it, it could go on. But it typically does not. And do you all know what the most common thing that happens to guys is when their prolactin level is elevated? Maybe I should say the most common thing that doesn't happen to guys when their prolactin level is. Were you watching up here, everybody? That. So what do you do? Like what do I do? No. <laughs> well, I have low prolactin. <laughs> what would you do? Oh, if it's prolactin, you could take medication. There could be medication. But no, no, that wouldn't be it. They would have to find out that you had, low, had high prolactin, and then they would give you something to bind to it. Not necessarily. They could give you something to bind to it or some other drug that naturally inhibits that, okay? No, well, I didn't say that. I just uh, have low prolactin, that's all. Okay. All right. Now, notice the back side here. Posterior. Everybody, you can say, I didn't say it to correct you, I just, that's how I say it. The neurohypothesis, I need everybody on their sheet to write something right here. Does not make hormones. Does, right here. Does not make hormones. I'll explain. Yes, sir. Daniel, right under it. Oxytocin. So, we're saying that this entire gland, the posterior pituitary, does not make hormones. So, let me show you a picture. Look here. Huh? Does it say that on there? Yeah, I used to have it on the old handout, but when it got remade, the person that remade it didn't put it. And that's okay. It's, there's stuff we want to add sometimes, right? We don't want the full picture right in front of us. Why would we need to come clap? So look here. What kind of cell is this? A neuron. And you know what? Since this is one neuron, but it's part of the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary, we can use some logic that we know about cells and... Protein synthesis usually occurs around the nucleus because that's where the DNA is and it goes out, messenger RNA, ribosomes, and all that stuff, right? Well, other chemicals, if they're produced, they're also going to be produced near the nucleus or at least in the cell body. So, ADH and oxytocin, these two hormones, are made, look, in the hypothalamus, in the cell bodies up here of the hypothalamus. They are released 
from the little terminals in the posterior pituitary. Right on. From the posterior pituitary. And we could even say they're stored down here in the posterior pituitary. See, they're produced up here, they travel down the axon, and they sit in the terminals until they're released. So they are stored. And remember, right guys, remember this. When you're at home listening to Tegrity, you can take a screen capture of this and you will have that all there just like I have it. I don't upload. Do what? And yeah, exactly. And then, oh, even Tegrity lets you print it out now. I forgot about that. Yeah, it does. So you can have all the completed pictures that I draw if you want. So keep that in mind that you can do that as well. I don't put the pictures online and attach them because it takes a lot of time to convert them over to JPEGs and attach everyone up when you already have access to all of these. Oh, you don't have to stop drawing. Well, you. So, like, the question was, so we always have oxytocin. Yeah, because, and this is an except, oxytocin happens to be a neurotransmitter and a hormone, okay, as the hormone that courses through the blood and stimulates uterine contractions during pregnancy or ejection of milk during breastfeeding. Well, that's always since it's a chemical made by those neurons, it's in the neuron, and it's stored in the terminal until there's a signal that says it to be released. And that signal would be the uterine stretching of the cervix or suckling on the breast, right? Or even your baby crying. Uh-huh. How many women have ever breastfed and you got to where your baby would just cry and you start to let milk down? Well, it's, it's just that. That's just how it works. You get conditioned to it. You're like, I know that cry, and your body knows that cry, and here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that in lecture. Absolutely, positively. Mm -hmm. It sure is. All right, so that's the pituitary. Hey, look. So now you know I could show you this slide on a test and say, name the hormones produced here. Alicia, don't answer. Awesome class. Awesome class. None. Check it out. Posterior pituitary produces no hormones. If I change the question to what hormones are released here, it would be ADH and oxytocin. But I'm just going to be honest with you. Every time I ask, name a hormone produced here. And every time, half the class bites on it and puts ADH or oxytocin. If I point to the posterior pituitary, which I will, I'm just telling you straight up. How can it be a trick if I tell you? I'm telling you. I'm going to point to the posterior pituitary. I am going to ask you what hormones are produced here or name a hormone produced here. The correct answer is no hormones are produced here. Right? Where are they produced? Up in the hypothalamus. Great. Now, what if I say just name a hormone produced here and I'm pointing to the front? Okay, I don't accept abbreviations. You need to understand that because you have to own this stuff right now. All right? And if you know what luteinizing hormone is, later in your life when you're reading a book, you can see LH and go, oh, maybe that was that lutein or whatever. But at least you own it now. Okay? So growth hormone, prolactin, adrenocorticotropic hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, or follicle stimulating hormone. Yes, maybe I've taught the class more than once because I know all the hormones now by heart. That's just how it goes. You don't get to rattle them off that fast the first time you're learning them. It takes a little time, right? And repetition. Remember, that's how memory works. And you teach the same class for 13 years, and oh my goodness, it gets a little easier. It gets a little easier. Yeah. Next. I like to, in class, do two glands and then let y'all look at them. Okay? So we're going to look at the thyroid gland. So let me pull up a picture of it. 
There's the information. You start looking at it already, and you'll notice there's two regions. Um, it is, and it's right there. You just passed the picture of it. It's 409, top of the page. It's a slide picture. I'll get there. Now, here's a thyroid on a lower power. Here's what I want you to notice. They don't all look exactly the same, but you can see a few things. This is a cluster called a follicle. Look, here's another follicle. See how it's got a border around it? It's kind of broken. Here's a follicle. Here's a follicle. Here's a follicle. If you're not looking up, you may not get the picture. Do you get the picture now? Are they all the same size, Andy? Go ahead. Question, sir. The whole thing. Each of these individual groupings is called a follicle. This is like, yeah, yeah, there's like a region, okay? Oh, no, not at all, not at all, because, how's that? Because fat is clear on the inside. It doesn't have anything in it. Oh, but no, no, you'll never think that adipose tissue. Oh, trust me, we'll... we'll Get down in there. Yes, ma'am. Um, oh, yeah. Great. Remember, the color's not the same up there. Oh, no. It depends. There, There's different shades. It's always lighter and darker, and the back's usually a pink, and the front's more of a reddish violet color, but it's not always purple. She's doing pituitary. She was talking about pituitary. So, no. It, it depends. We have a couple different slides. No, there's not a particular color on that. So, look up here now, guys. What's this? A follicle. Now, on this view, you can see. You see the dots? What are those? Those are the nuclei of the cells all the way around. Now, visualize this. And this is back to me. Each one of these follicles is like a basketball. It's three-dimensional. And it's got one individual layer all the way around, okay? One single layer of cells all the way around. So when you cut it, you just like are looking into the basketball, and that one layer is like the skin of the basketball, okay? But it's still one layer of cell. Now, this right here doesn't look like one layer. That's because it's turned on edge. It was cut at an angle a little bit. So it picked up a little bit more than one layer there because it kind of has some depth to it. This stuff in the center is called colloid. It's called colloid. C-O-L-L-O-I-D. Mm -hmm. Colloid. Yes, ma'am. And I'm going to go ahead and open up a... Oh. I'll tell you. Oh, look at you reading up there, you big reader. Don't read up there. Those are somebody else's notes. They're not mine. It is, but I'm not going to tell you what he told you. So watch out, world. He's right. I'm not telling you he's wrong. I just don't do that in lab like that. Look, what are these? Well, today, they're two follicles. They could be two cells. They could be whatever, right? Now they're follicles. Look what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you that I could do this. I could go and draw all the way around like this. And I could take lots of time to do this and keep going all the way around and tell you these are all little cuboidal cells all the way around there, right? So I just did that. And then, what's on the inside? Look, C-O-L-L-O-I-D. And what color is it? Pink. It is pink. That's almost always pink. That's just how they stain these slides. We may have one thyroid slide that's funky red. It's old. I don't know how it keeps getting thrown out there, but it always does. So I'll just tell you that. So what is this whole thing? Follicle. And what's in here? Colloid. And does it look complete yet? No, but that's okay, because it's not, all right? I don't want to draw all the way around it. Now, let me tell you something. These cells right here are called, it's so tough. No, 
That's what you're going to learn is things don't always follow the rules. Cuboidal cells don't always look squared off. They can be bulbous in all kinds of crazy shapes. They usually have a nice round nucleus, though. Okay? You'll get the feel for that as we go through the semester. I don't expect you to have a feel for it yet because all you did in AMP1 was histology and some of you did it real brief. And that's okay. That's okay. I will also tell you that there's some cells that are scattered as little clusters that are not. Can you tell those are not part of a follicle? Can you see that? It's a blob. And it's a blob for a reason. Okay? Watch what it is. Here it is. See these cells? See the little blob of cells right there? Wait, hold on. Is that in this follicle? Is it in this follicle? So those are the nuclei of cells called... Look at your sheet. What do you think, Stacy? Under the thyroid. Not the follicle cells, but the... You see right below it? Parafollicular cells. Parafollicular. Um, well, my drawings do. They're just not attached to the follicle. They're in between. They're kind of cuboidal as well. And I just made a mass of them. And that is basic thyroid. Well, well, I don't do that in lecture. So we don't need to know what thyroid is in there? Not, not, I'm sorry, I only do that in lecture. I don't do it for lab. I will tell you, here's what I will tell you. The colloid is the stored form of thyroid hormone. Stored form of thyroid hormone. On your sheet, if you peek at your sheet, you'll see that there are two thyroid hormones. The thyroid hormones are called thyroxin and triiodothyronine. T3 and T4. Actually, notice it says thyroid hormones colon. So the thyroid hormones are T3 and T4. You think you can put T3 and T4 as an answer on a test? No. Only if I ask you, What's the shortest name possible for thyroxin? It would be T4. Okay, but I won't ask you that. I'll tell you in lecture that it has to do with how many iodines are part of the molecule, but that's a little depth that we don't need right now. Okay? So the two thyroid hormones are called thyroxin and triiodothyronine. I know it's going to take you some time to learn those names. My point with going through this isn't to give you time to learn the names yet, it's to familiarize you with the big picture. The big picture is those two hormones are stored in the center attached to other stuff. And when they're stored and attached, we call it colloid. In lecture, I'll tell you what Dr. Crawford put on the board, and that's that they're attached to thyroglobulin. Okay? But I'm not going to do that in lab, even though I said it. I won't ask you that. The stored form of thyroid hormone is referred to as colloid. It's referred to... Hmm? T3 and T4 are the hormones and they are stored attached to other proteins and collectively it's all called colloid. Yeah, they're the only thyroid hormones. Mm -hmm. They are. The T3 and the T4. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at them. What could I ask you on this? Name this cell. Name these cells. One, name one hormone produced by this cell. Thyroxine. Good. Triiodothyronine. Right on. Tri means three. Iodo means iodine. Name this pink material. Colloid. What is colloid? Stored form of the thyroid hormone. By the way, the thyroid is the only gland that does that, that stores a large percentage of its hormone in another form 
Other glands don't do that. It stores a few weeks' worth. If you have a thyroid problem, you'll have a thyroid problem for a couple of weeks, a couple, three weeks before you even know it and start to show symptoms because it's storing and it eats that up before you start to see the problem. And, of course, that depends what kind of problem. Name the hormone produced by the parafollicular cells. Calcitonin. I don't expect you to know it yet. I expect you to look at your sheet and understand that you could look there. Does the thyroid then have two distinct regions? Yes. What do you think the thyroid hormone's main function is? Look up here and look at the asterisk. That's what I want you to know for lab. It increases the metabolic rate. How many people didn't know that thyroid had to do with weight? Everybody knows that. And your weight's all about your metabolism. I'll go into the other stuff in lecture class. We'll go a little further and a little more in depth. Okay? Now, I also like to say this. Calcitonin, the very first semester I taught this, you probably heard it if you listen to the other integrity because I may have said it. There was a girl in my class named Tony. And it just so happens that Tony is in the middle of calcitonin. Do you see that, T-O-N-I? That's how she spelled her name. Anyway, calcitonin lowers blood calcium. That's its job. Do you see where it's hidden right here? It says that. That's its main job. That's the first thing you need to know about it. Okay, it lowers blood calcium. And calcitonin lowers blood calcium... And there's a hormone that raises it. And some people confuse them because you know how opposites are. It's hard. So what do you do? You own one and you understand the other. Now, I don't care which one you own, but I'll give you a little hint. Calcitonin tones down calcium. And when you hear that, it just rolls. Somehow it just rolls off the tongue. Calcitonin tones down calcium. Sharice, sound easy? Tones down calcium, right? Lowers calcium. We always need to know our focal point is what? Where is the focal point for calcium? And it's up there. Look, it's not. See, our brains are trained because of osteoporosis and because of commercials to think bone. Yeah. Even though most of the calcium is the bone, our focus is blood calcium. Okay, that's our focus. So when we say tones down calcium, we mean lowers it in the blood. It lowers the blood calcium. Therefore, my question is, where does it put it? It puts it in the bone. It puts it in the bone. And if it puts it in the bone, man, do you see how much information you're learning? I mean, how much there is to this? Fortunately, most of you talked about this part in AMP1, I bet. What cells build bone? Carmelita. It's, yeah, osteo what? Build? Osteo what? What do you say? It's osteo B builds. It's osteoblast. Osteoblast. Think B for build. Okay? And C for chew up. So osteoclasts chew it up, osteoblasts build it. So let's think about this. If we're going to take calcium out of the blood and lower it, we're going to put it in the bone and store it. What cells do we activate or turn on? Osteobuilders, osteoblasts. You see that? It stimulates the osteoblasts. And it happens to, and we'll just use logic now, shut down the other ones. Okay? If it stimulates the builders, isn't it going to shut down the destroyers? Right? So look, that's what it says here. That's what this means. Inhibits osteoclastic activity and stimulates osteoblastic activity. Builds bone, lowers blood calcium. That's calcitonin. And by the way, you'll hear this in lecture again. This is one of those great topics for learning opposites. Own one, understand concepts with the other. You can always get there. Calcitonin does what? Tones down calcium. So what's its opposite parathyroid have to do? Raise it up. Raise it up. Raises blood calcium. And if it raises it, it's stealing it from the bone. So 
So it's stimulating osteoclasts, okay? And look, that was just logic. I wasn't memorizing. I don't know if you could tell by how I talked. That wasn't memorized. That was taking you down a pathway saying, if you know one thing, it leads you to the next, and that leads you to the next, and that leads you to the next. And that kind of knowledge you keep. That kind of knowledge you keep longer than just pure out-and-out -out memorization. Because there's understanding. Sure, you have to learn osteoclasts and osteoblasts and what they do, but you know you've had that before. So it's not as hard to learn the second time through. Parathyroid, I'm not going to talk about it anymore in lab, except to say you've got to know everything that's on there. And I'm going to add a target. This wasn't on there, so I need to add this. Yeah, so you want to write it in probably. And I've added it before and it just didn't make the final cut somehow. What I will do when I'm done with all the labs this week and done with the night lab too, I'm going to re-upload this to the lab sheet with those asterisks and everything on there in the correct form. So if you want to make another printout, that would be cool. Or you could simply just open it up online and then look at yours, you know. Yeah. I just added intestines. So you guys tell me, what are the three targets of parathyroid? See, bone intestines and kidney. I love how you said bone. I know that says osseous tissue. I'm sorry, that's just a little fancy for me. You can say bone on both of those. Okay? That's bone. I won't count it wrong if you say osseous tissue. But you don't need to flex your muscle. You can say bone. Yeah. Say you know, your mental muscle on that one. You can just say bone. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at some slides. And I'm going to pause the recording. Cause we have two more slides for the moment. Then we'll get to the last two. We're going to start with the pancreas. And look which one we're going to skip. Oh, parathyroid we kind of mentioned, right? But you're going to learn most of it on your own. The adrenal gland, we're going to come back to. Why? Because it's got so much information. Now, this semester, we're fortunate. We drew it in class. We've talked about it. You've got a preview. There is a method to my madness. You know it has regions. You know those regions make hormones. Pancreas, bless you. The pancreas, like many of these glands, has multiple parts to it. But I will tell you, the endocrine-producing part is only one part. Okay? I'll, I'll say that again, and I'll show you the picture. It'll make it easier. See this right here? See how it's separated away from everything else? And it looks like a little island. It's called an islet of Langerhans. That is the endocrine portion of the pancreas. There are over a million of those in a normal pancreas. It's a lot. There's over a million of those in a pancreas. Yes, absolutely. I'm zoomed up. It's this whole thing that is pulled apart from all of this other tissue right here. It's usually lighter. However, there's a couple of slides that it's not that much lighter. That is one islet of Longer Hans. His name's not plural. That was his name, Longer Hans, the doctor. Islets means there's multiple. Now look at this right here. Oh, we'd have a quiz, but it's the first lab, so I'm not going to sweat it. All right. See, here's the islet. Everybody see that? Here's another one over here, but it's blurry and hard to see. Do you see this thing here? That's not an islet. That's a crevice with some connective tissue in it, and maybe, just maybe, blood vessels and stuff were not zoomed up enough. Make sure you understand, this is not hollow, is it? I don't want you to go up on some hollow duct or hollow blood vessel and say, oh, there it is. It's got stuff in it, and those are cuboidal cells. Look at this next picture. Oh, it's kind of the same. Do I zoom up anymore? Look at this one. I think this is even better for contrast up there. It's not as good on the computer, but it's better on your projector in class. Look at this. Are these cuboidal? The answer is yes. Okay, this is the outer part of the pancreas. Not sure if you're aware or not, but the Tegrity lecture talks about that. It says the pancreas has both exocrine and endocrine. 
okay? And the exocrine part, do you remember what that means from AMP1? Ducts. It has ducts. And the exocrine part is called the pancreatic acini. That is 90% of this tissue that you see around here. All of this, I'll show you. Here it is. A-C-I-N-I. -I, the pancreatic acini. The endocrine portion, we know. What's it called? Islets. And you have to spell longer on. You mean here? You mean here? No. No, you still... It, it could destroy some, but I don't know about it that much, to be honest. What you would get is invasion of connective tissue, probably. Yeah. Hmm. But remember, 90% of the tissue is exocrine, so it's going to probably be more damaged. The digestive part. The digestive part. So let's look at it again. This is the pancreatic what? ACNI. I need you to know what its generic function is. Digestive. It makes digestive enzymes. Yes, the ACNR portion. The pancreatic ACNI makes digestive enzymes. Does the islet make digestive enzymes? No, it makes hormones. Right, it makes hormones and it secretes them in the blood and they go looking for receptors on target cells and name one hormone that's produced by the pancreas, the islet of Langerhans. Insulin. Well, did we not talk about that earlier today? Wow, we talked about downregulation. We talked about how insulin causes glucose uptake into cells. Insulin's the one you're going to own. Look at the handout. Islets of Langerhans, insulin lowers blood sugar, right? That's right here. That's what it does. Targets most cells, especially the liver cells, but lots of body cells, and it causes the cells to take up sugar. But look, I didn't just say just the liver. The liver can do it. Okay, go ahead. I, I think of it excreting the liver. Oh, no. What? Insulin is secreted not by the liver, by the, I mean, the pancreas. pancreas. The liver. We're not even going to, it's not an endocrine gland. It does it, it makes lots of enzymes. Why does what go to the liver? Well, the hormone goes to the liver and causes the liver cells to take in sugar. The, and it goes to, we just happen to have liver there because, you know, it goes to the liver and it does this particular function right here in the liver. If you look up there for a second, it does that to the liver, okay? But it does, most cells in the body it does this to, including liver cells, causes them to take in sugar. Do cells, don't cells get energy from sugar? Yeah. Hey, Stacy, do you think your liver needs energy? Yeah. So, its cells would take in sugar and insulin tells that to happen. Okay? Now, if you own this, insulin decreases blood, blood glucose. What does its opposite do? Increases it. And its opposite is called glucagon and you have to spell it perfect. One letter off, I count it totally wrong. Because in this chapter, we talk about glucose. We talk about glycogen. We talk about glucagon. We talk about gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. And I know that's more terms than you want to have thrown at you right now, but I'm just telling you, the G words are very important in this chapter. They're so important that you should know some differences. And I'll cover that more in lecture. All right? So I'm not going to go all the way through you know, this right here. I will say... Glycogen, anybody remember it from AMP1? Just raise your hand if you remember hearing its name. Okay, cool. Now raise your hand if you know what it is and if you would stake your grade in AMP2 on it. 
Wait, you can't read it. Oh man, you're so close. But no. It's starch, which is a big long chain of glucoses. It is a polysaccharide. Glycogen is a big long chain of sugars all together and it's stored mostly in the muscles and in your liver. And that makes it your heart. It's stored there because that heart's a muscle, right? So this glycogen is the stored form of sugar in a big chain. If we need sugar, we chop up the chain, we break down the glycogen and we free the sugar. So look, glucagon increases blood sugar by breaking down the big chain, breaking down the glycogen. It goes into the blood and raises the sugar up. That's how it works. Yes? No. You forgot what? Hey, let me ask you a question. Does that look anything like a thyroid? Anything like a pituitary? I just gave you a great tip for studying. Never go too far down the road without looking back. Because what happens if you travel too far down the road without looking back, you forget that stuff, okay? If you just go a little bit and then you go, oh yeah, what's a pituitary? Anterior, posterior, big line down the middle, right? What's a thyroid? Follicles with little cells around them and colloid in the center. Then you keep that mental picture and you look at this and you go, nothing like the other two. Sure, we can say this. This kind of looks like an anterior pituitary, but there's no big line. Right? There's not two types of tissue completely separated. This is a little island or a pocket in the center. And that makes it an islet of longer Hans. All right. Now you know what we've got to do. We've got to do the big bad one, the adrenal gland. This adrenal gland has two main regions, a cortex and a medulla. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Good. Two main regions. What are they called, anybody? Good, cortex and a medulla. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open the one up from lecture class. Because you guys know if you see the same thing, it helps, right? Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Night. Oh, did I not save our adrenal? Yeah, it's all gone. Look at that. Oh, adrenal overview. There it is. That's us because we were the first one to have that class. There it is. See, when you see the same one, it sparks your memory. and You go, oh yeah, cortex with three parts. Zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis. A medulla right here. I want to show you, though because I put a little detail different right here. Yeah, I am. And that way you can integrity it later, you know. But here's what I'll show you. Look here at the three layers. See how I drew the glomerulosa as little clumps and circles? I know it's kind of hard to see. And look here. It looks stacked like a column in the fasciculata. That's because that's what we'll see when we look at the gland. Clumps, and then stacks, and then more clumps. Which what? The clumps, this, look here. Glomerulosa. And that's on your sheet, right? Everybody look at your sheet, because you don't have to just put what I put. You can look to your sheet and see here. Adrenal cortex, three parts. Zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis. And here's the name of the hormone produced in each region, right here. But remember, all this information, Stacy, is right on your sheet. Okay. Yeah, it's right in front of you. Look. No, but you're not going to learn on this either, because I'm about to pull up the picture, and that's where, honestly, that's where you're really going to learn it. Okay. Let's start with this. 
and I'm going to turn off the light. What's the first thing you see? You know what that is, Keisha? Yeah. That's fat, guys, right there. If you don't believe me, believe me. Look, I'll move up. Look, those are fat cells. Okay? Let's see. Those are great fat cells. So here's what I just told you without telling you anything. Would you agree that this is probably the gland? Right? There's the way that I do the adrenal, the way that the slides that we have, there's always fat on the outside. And just my little deal with you is I will always at least show you like this, a little fat so you can orient yourself. Okay? Fat's towards the outside. Now let me show you back on the picture. Right here would be the fat out here. Couldn't it go all the way around and be down here? Mm -hmm. Right? But we're just going to orient ourselves top to bottom right now. There's the fat. So this right here, look, there's a border, right? This is a wavy connective tissue border, and we call it the capsule. And I didn't show it to you before, but that's the capsule. All adrenal glands have a capsule. It's a capsule. It's a connective tissue capsule that covers the organ. Picture time. Okay, look here. Here's the fat. Do you see this tissue? I know it's difficult, but look how it's wavy and it goes back and forth this way. Do you guys see that? It's like a band going right here. And look, here it kind of separates and goes up. We're not going to worry about that part. But there's a band that goes right across there. Those, those are collagen fibers. That is a dense, regular kind of connective tissue. Don't sweat it for now. It's just connective tissue. That's what I want you to know. Now look here. It changes. We get cubes, cuboidal. See those nuclei, how pretty they are? That You're going to start getting used to seeing nuclei like that and going, oh, that's cuboidal cells. Let me ask you a question. Is this a long, tall column? And is this a long, tall column? and maybe this and this. Look here. This, this. See how they're long? Now look with me. Isn't that more of a clump? Isn't that more of a clump? Isn't this stuff kind of clumpy and ugly? So here's what we got. Outside, capsule, first part, long part. Tell me what the long part here is called. Zona fasciculata. Right? All we have to do is look, see how long it is? And we go back here. It's this long part right here. Zona fasciculata. Sometimes it, you don't learn it all in class. You just got to be okay with that. Okay? That's why we record them and you go back and study later. So that's the zona fasciculata. This above it is zona glomerulosa. And this right here, what is it? The capsule. And right here? adipose or fat. So you always go in layers. It goes adipose, capsule, which is connective tissue. Notice you've got to abbreviate your notes. Adipose capsule, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis, and then what's in the middle? Adrenal medulla. From here to there. Fat capsule, glomerulosa, fasciculata, reticularis, and then the medulla. Can you now see why I showed you that gland the first day? 
There's a lot to it. Imagine if this was the first time I ever mentioned it to you and threw those big words on it, okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at this slide. You're going to start off on a low power. Here's your clue. Look, this specific, is this obviously longer than this stuff? And I'm going to guess that you can't tell what that is at all. Would that be fair? I mean, if I just showed you, if I didn't show you any of this, and I just showed you a picture from right here, would you have a clue what you were looking at? Probably not, but look what you get. Fat, and then look here. See, it's wavy going that way. And then we got some clumps. Not many, but we see clumps, and then it gets long. That's how you know this. Does it look anything like any other gland? No, so all you have to do is you learn your layers. When you see fat, and you see a capsule, you know you're in the adrenal gland, you find the fasciculata, and tell me what's between the long fasciculata and the glomerulo and the sorry capsule. The zona glomerulosa. And that's how you do it. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna now remember on the slide of the adrenal gland we didn't see the adrenal medulla. That doesn't mean that you're not responsible for it. It's not on the slide, but you need to know the information. It's the middle part. We did the drawing. Everybody knows where it's at. You already know epi and norepi from the nervous system. They do a lot of stuff. In lecture, I'll have so much fun with this, I'll relate it back to the sympathetic nervous system and what happens when a bear walks through the door. Anybody ever hear that before? A couple people have, okay? And it's fun to talk about that stuff. But for right now, just know that it... Hey, if adrenaline, these are adrenaline. When you've heard adrenaline all your life, that's these. What do they do to your heart rate? And what do they probably do to your blood pressure? Raise it. Look, look at the functions. Increase heart rate, vasoconstriction, that means vessels get smaller and your pressure goes up. Look at that, you knew it. You just didn't know you knew it. There's so much anatomy that you already know, you just didn't know that you know it. Star, star. Yeah, for sure, star, star. And by the way, they both do both of these, but norepi is the more powerful vasoconstrictor, so that's why I have it separated like this. They both do a little bit. They both increase the heart rate, but norepi is the bigger vasoconstrictor. I won't make a big difference on that in lab. Okay, last two. Now, it's not the last two on the sheet. I'm going to let you teach yourself the other ones on this sheet well, as well as us talking about them in lecture, okay? But we're just focusing on the slides, so we have the ovaries and the testes left today. Lab book has a great picture of these right here. Depending on which version of the lab book you have, it may look different. Now, I know what you're doing. You're going through your lab book in Chapter 27, Exercise 27, and it's not there. That's because... Testes are reproductive. So it's at the back of the book in the reproductive chapter. That's exercise 42, I think. It is. In my book, it happens to be on 632. Doesn't mean it's 632 in your book. Right. Oh, it is? So that probably means it is on everybody's book, both versions. Cool, finally. This is the first time in five years we've had old and new books on the same pages. At least. This picture doesn't look exactly like yours, does it? Why does this picture not look exactly like yours? Because this is the picture out of the lecture book. The picture out of the lab book looks slightly different. Okay, 632. Boom. Do you see on your book, not up there, because this looks like it, but not as much. Do you see two things that look like kiwis? You ever cut a kiwi fruit? Can you see that? Look here. This looks different, but you see that's the kiwi part, and then there's a hollow center. The way they've done it is they're showing you two of them, and they're centralized on this one, and you see some of that one as well. And colorization is a little different. All right, those are not kiwis. 
And I know when you're thinking of reproductive structures and testes, if you see two anything, I don't know what your brain thinks, those are not two testes that you're seeing there. The kiwi is not the testy. Look here, I'll orient you. See this little teeny tiny golden tube? Each testis, that is technical for one of the testes. Okay, it's not testicle anymore. And it's definitely not those other words that you know. There are over 900 of these coiled tubes in one testis. Yes, testis, 900. Wow. Now look here. This is the tube. Here's the hollow part in the center of the tube. What's any hollow part called? Oh, y'all don't know that? I'm just going to use this because I can. The hollow part of a tube is called a lumen. The hollow part of any tube could typically be called a lumen. Okay. And that is absolutely where the sperm are. I know your book says immature sperm, right? I'm not going to play that game, immature or not. You're just going to call them sperm in here. See right there on my picture? I know. But right here, look on your picture, that part, that hollow part, that's where the sperm are. They don't look like sperm really, do they? Because it's kind of blurry and you don't see it really well. The sperm are in the lumen. Look here. Do you see this is an obvious border of this tube? Okay. Can you see that this is another tube down here? And here's its lumen? Now, I know your book doesn't show that one. Yours shows one on the other side, right? So you, no? Go further. Yeah, and on the other side? Right. And that thing in the middle is different. Okay? In your book, which I like your picture better, bear with me, look here. Up at me, up at that. Up at that, sorry. Here's a tube. And here's a tube. Can you tell that this tissue right here is not part of either of those tubes? That this tissue right here is not this tube and not this tube. It's tissue in between. Right? Do you all see that? And really, can you see there's another tube starting right here? Man, that's tough. Anyway, those cells, which are much better in your book, are called interstitial cells. Find them in your lab book. It's very easy in your lab book. It's perfect, I might add. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it means between. Yeah, it's a slide. No, ma'am. The, the border's not called anything. It's just showing you the, the border of the seminiferous tubule. It's not called anything. Oh, no. It's still alive. So how about... We find a picture. Why? You don't want to look at a cadaver? We have great testy pictures. Don't take that the wrong way. Here you go. Look here. This is the... Wait, wait. This is the lowest power. Obviously, if I have 50 of them on here, I'm not zoomed up as much. Got to get the kids. Oh, anyway. Look, that's what we're seeing, right? Look, here's the lumen. So what's in there? Sperm. What's this? Interstitial cells. What do they make? Take a wild guess. They're in the testes and make a hormone? Testosterone. Testosterone. Right, Mallory? Okay. And look here. These cells you need to know the name of. Your book is not incorrect, but it's not what we're going to use. And there's a very important reason for that. We're going to call these cells spermatocytes. Cyte means cell, correct? You can see spermato because it's written in your book. Look here. Look up there. 
Your book is calling these spermatogenic cells. Cross out spermatogenic, not the whole thing, but where it says genic, put site, C-Y-T-E. Here's why. When we do meiosis, which is reproduction of these gametes, these sex cells, they're going to call them primary and secondary spermatocytes. So I don't want to teach you spermatogenic and then later say, oh, they're also called spermatocytes. Why don't I just teach you from the start what we're always going to call them? And that makes it easier. All right, once again, what is this entire object? Oh, those are the cells, right? Seminiferous tubules. How many per testy about? 900. What's in here? Yes, don't put spermies on a test, okay? They are sperm. You know, people put weird stuff on these A&P tests. Uh-huh, spermies. They're little spermies. People say the weirdest things in A&P class, you know? No, those are sperm. By the way, sperm and semen's different. The cells are sperm, semen's the fluid and everything that's there. These are spermatocytes, these are? And they make? testosterone -y. Over 900 tubules, seminiferous tubules. Yeah, it is. Okay, now this, here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to record the ovary now. We ran out of time. We're going to look at these two next week. I have to go, okay, because time's up. If you want to stay, you're welcome to stay in here and look at slides. I, I don't mind. But, wait, don't put it up. We're going to take notes on the ovary, right? I'm going to give you the notes, then we're going to go. Um, we will, next week, if you notice, it's blood and endocrine. We set time to review all the endocrine and to look at these slides. It's okay. It's not like we're really behind. So I will tell you this. You definitely need to download your blood sheet and listen to your blood lab integrity. Okay? It's a little over an hour. I don't know how long it is exactly. Maybe it's less. It might actually be 45 minutes. You need to own the blood sheet. You should be very familiar with it. Here's why. That will make lab a review, and the very next week we have a test. And if you come in here and already learn that blood information, the blood slides become so easy. They really are. And then you have a chance to review all of this. Versus if you don't learn the information outside, I mean, you can still do the lab, but then you have to study right before the test and you don't have me here necessarily answer questions and it just goes smoother. Question, Snowvery. Remember, I'm just teaching you the information. It will not be easy to understand. The book has no decent pictures. Okay? This is the border of the ovary. Look with me. It goes all the way around. All right? Remember you have this. You can listen to it later. In the middle, we have lots of other tissue, but do you see how we have all these hundreds of circles around here and around here and around here? Do you notice at all how they're smaller out here and they get bigger as they push in? Okay? This is an ovary that's immature. It doesn't have a lot of stuff going on. So we basically see two types of these little things. And I'll tell you, they're called follicles. By the way, to anybody, I don't know if you can tell, do you know that um, famous drawing, Starry Night? Do you see the swirls up there? Can your brain see that and bring that to conjure that up? That's what I think of when I see an ovary. Now, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to zoom up on these. Because really in the ovary, there are only three things we have to know. Other than it's an ovary and it makes estrogen and progesterone. Look how easy this is. Big follicle, little baby follicle, right? If you see a good picture and zoom up, it's easy. Why is it hard? Because you don't have it in your book like this, and that's scary sometimes. But you have it on integrity, all right? This little baby follicle is called a primordial follicle. Ready? because I know you want me to spell it for you. A primordial 
follicle. It looks kind of like this. Because it is simple squamous epithelium around the edge here. The other follicle that you're seeing is bigger and it's called a primary follicle. And guess what it is around the edge? Uh, wait, you do know. Don't trick yourself. Look here. How many layers? One. That's simple. Are they stratified or cubes? Cubes. cubes. That's a simple cuboidal epithelium. These are two primary follicles. These are many primordials down here. Yes, simple squamous. The third thing we're going to get to, I'm waiting for you all to finish your notes. Watch this. You see that? Doesn't it look like a nucleus? Doesn't that? Well, in the ovary, in these cells that are going to develop, these are going to become your sex cells. It's going to get ovulated and it's going to get fertilized and turn into a person. This is called an oocyte. Two O's and then C-Y-T-E. Oocyte. Exactly. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. See, look, guys, these are the most immature. And as they grow and develop, the cells hypertrophy around them. Now, they go through more stages later, but that, we, don't, we don't have a slide that shows that. So they go from primordial to primary to secondary to graphene, and then it gets ovulated out. This is the little thing that gets ovulated. And that is your ovary. We'll do more on it in lecture. Okay, we'll talk about, hey, it didn't take. Estrogen comes from the follicle.